Can you all see a wonderful welcoming um, slide? Fantastic, that's good. Um, good lot of audience participation. So um, let's get cracking. So first of all, I'd just like to welcome you to the Virtual Agile group. Um, meetup group. It's really lovely to see some uh, returners, but also some new faces as well. Um, if uh, yeah, just to say thank you, really, for spending your precious time, um, your your next sort of hour and a quarter or so uh, with us this evening, or this morning, or this afternoon, wherever you are calling in from. So thank you very much for that. Just to uh, go through a few bits of. Uh, housekeeping. Um, firstly, if you don't know who I am, you haven't been here before, then my name is Helen Garcia. Um, I am a Scrum Master, an Agile coach, and um, just, you know, generally a fun person. I don't know, I just added that. I'm not very good with improvisation, as you can tell, so I'm just going to go with that. Um, and my wonderful co-host, uh, Miss Innes, please introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Innes Garcia. I'm an Agile coach and a Salesforce MVP. Um, these two things means that I help companies to become more agile whilst we deliver Salesforce technology. Um, and I recently published a book also inventing always things. Uh, and that reminds me that um, if there are any Scrum Masters that are interested to collaborate on a free resource for their peers, um, just ping me because I had an idea uh, yesterday. So. Uh, let's invent something together. Thank you, Ines. And as always, coming up with lots of different kinds of ideas. But um, so that's who we are. Um, this group is for absolutely everybody. So it doesn't matter if you're a lover of Agile, if you're a hater of Agile, if you're an in-betweener or you just turned up and you're like, I don't know even how I got here, then you are very welcome. And it's very good to, to, to have you here. Um, like I said in the beginning, we are recording this session. Um, we have around about a uh, one hour 15, something like that. Um, Karen is going to be talking for around about 45 minutes, more or less, um, something like this. And then we'll have a couple of uh, minutes for questions as well. Um, we love a bit of collaboration. So please utilize the chat um, if, you, if you want to ask any questions, if you have any wonderful ideas that you'd like to share with us, um, whatever it might be, uh, Innes will be uh, be hosting that chat, so um, so we should be able to hear everything. And obviously, if you want to come off mute and talk to us as well, that's also really great. Um, fire exits. Mine is here. Yours is wherever yours is. Um, just leave the house would be my recommendation. Exactly. Um, cool. So uh, if you have ever <laughs> been involved in any presentation that I've done, or worked with me, or I'd spend any time with me whatsoever, really. I love the game Rock, Paper, Scissors. And because I am a Scrum Master, I like to utilize any game and just basically bastardize it so it works for me and so I can get some kind of audience participation. So anyone up for a game of Rock, Paper, Scissors? Me. Cool, you've all got <laughs> great. It's always good to warm your hands up, isn't it? So can I see your best, <laughs> great warm up, <laughs> your best rock? Yeah, some great, we've got some grabbing of rocks as well. So that's really nice. Excellent. And pair of scissors. Does everybody know what a pair of scissors looks like? I prefer this or this to this, but depending on what mood you're in. Excellent. Very good. Okay, so I have four questions. Very easy question. Can you show me a rock if a yes, a paper if you're not sure, and a scissor for a no? This is my first time at the virtual agile meetup. Mm, bit of a mixed bag there, a mixed bag. Some people have got no idea, so welcome. You're at the Virtual Agile Meetup. Um, second question, I'm excited to be here. Am I? <laughs> yes. Oh, thank goodness for that. If there are any scissors out there, then I really hope that we can change your mind on this because we've got some, uh, we've got, you know, Karen with us tonight. So that's um, really, really exciting. And my third question is Thursday, the new Friday. <laughs> yeah, I tend to agree with the scissors out there. No. <laughs> and lastly, and this is a really important question. So please, you know, pay attention, take it seriously. 
is ham and pineapple pizza really should be made illegal? <laughs> I, I may have lost a few people there, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We're gonna make it illegal tonight, so that's good. Um, right, so without uh, uh, any more games or any more rock, paper, scissors, um, uh, just to talk about why we made this group very quickly, like Ines and I basically in the middle of last year got asked a lot about how the remote working actually affected our agile environment and doing our jobs as scrum masters because it's usually very like face to face interactions and um, all of that sort of stuff. It's part of the agile values. Um, well, supposedly part of the agile values, but actually it made no difference to the way that we work. We are pretty much 100% like remote anyway in our day to day lives over the past few years. We've, we've been like that forever. Um, so we've got lots of tips and tricks on how to, to make that work. So that was one of the reasons we wanted to set up the group. Um, and also just so we could meet and actually have fun with with, with other people, people all over the world. I mean, this is one of the great things about remote working at the moment is that, you know, it's six o'clock in the UK, but actually, you know, somewhere else it may be later or earlier and we can actually see each other without having to jump on a plane and destroy the planet. So that's really good. Um, right, so I'll stop rambling on and actually start to talk about Karen a little bit more. So thank you so much, Karen, for joining us today. Um, it's really, honestly, really great to have you on board here. And for those, uh, just to just to introduce you, um, you are three times author, author. I've only got two of your books up here, but listening, listen up and working from home. Oh, yes. And we actually have some physical, yeah. <laughs> physical shows of that as well. Uh, you are a TEDx speaker of, am I right in saying it is when Jeeves met Alexa? Yes. <laughs> sounds, it, it sounds interesting. We, we did watch it the other day, actually. So it was really, really great. And I recommend you checking it out. I think Ines is going to post, um, post it in the chat as well, if you wouldn't mind, that would be amazing. Um, you're also the VP of Customer Service and Market Insights for Salesforce. Um, and a customer experience leader and every everything foodie everything in between so i'll let you introduce yourself a bit better than what i've done but i am so excited to have you here so without any further ado karen i hand over to you thank you so much i love starting off with the rock paper scissors and i might have to borrow that and use it in one of my own upcoming meetings i will credit the innovation to this group. And what I love about this time where we have the opportunity to be together in these kinds of settings is we learn a lot about each other. And Helen, when you mentioned the location of the fire exits, it brought a story to mind. I'll never forget the time when I was away from my home back when we did that. Do you remember when you left home and you went to other places that were far, far away? And I happened to look down at my mobile device just in time to see a text notification that said the smoke alarm in my house was going off. And I wasn't there and no one else was either. And so I quickly screamed out loud, I think my house is on fire. About the time I'm getting a phone call from kind of the monitoring company and they say, uh, are you home? And I'm like, no, I'm not. You should send the fire department. And the only thing in that moment I could think of to do was to look through my ring doorbell, right? This like video camera doorbell. And even though it's on the outside of where I live and it's pointed toward the street, my thought was, I guess if the fire is bad enough, maybe I'll be able to see, I guess, the flame shooting out of my house. I don't know if that would have been comforting or not. But all I could do was just be fixed to this mobile device, watching a potentially life-changing crisis in the making from far away. And at that moment, it hit me. I thought, okay, I have a, a friend who has a key to my house and she does not live very far away. Maybe I can call her. So I, I ring her and you know, it's a Saturday evening and she picks up the phone right away and says, Hey, what's up? And I screamed, I think my house is on fire and I'm trying to watch it through the ring doorbell. And she's like, Oh my gosh. I said, could you go to my house and meet the fire department? I don't know what I thought she was going to do, by the way, like bring a bucket. I, you know, 
if there's a fire, could you help put it out? She says, no problem. She hops in her car, drives over. And now I'm watching through this video camera from far away, like fire trucks pulling up in front of my house with all of the lights going. And as I paused and thought about what you said just then, I thought, isn't that sort of how we've been feeling since last March? Like someone started a fire somewhere and we're all watching it through this video device. Like what is going to go up in flames next? And what I found during that period of time is what's gone up in flames next is a lot of things that we had planned. Right. And what I love about this group and being with you is, I mean, you're agile by definition, right? Your entire world is helping all of us respond to the stories that pop up unexpectedly and feel a connection with those. And what I want to talk a little bit about today is this whole kind of first responder mentality, this approach of what happens to us and how we respond when we feel like everything around us is burning down. And we almost feel powerless, like we're like we're watching it from far away. Have any of you felt that at all during this period of time? Like, like this thing is all happening over there, and what do I do? I'm not a trained firefighter, which brings me kind of to my first question for all of you. I'd love to have you put in the chat. Uh, yes, make cookies for the firemen. That's a that's a very good idea. Um, by the way, it was very interesting because when one of the firemen walked up to the door, he started talking to me through like the video and I could not figure out how to talk back to him through my panic. Like I was trying to be like, it's my house burning down. But instead it was like this, like, like he couldn't hear anything. So it wasn't really that effective. My first question for you is, you know, when you look out at this blazing fire around us and you think about being in your work from home environment, first question, what is your biggest work from home or work at a distance challenge right now? Put it in the chat. Focus. Yes, this dealing with distractions is a challenge, isn't it? I mean, if we were all in a meeting together in person, you know, we're competing for each other's attention with email, you know, anything that you can access on your mobile device. Now we're also competing for this distracted attention of you could do the laundry, you could be ordering the groceries, you know, to be delivered for dinner. Your, your child needs help with e-learning while you're in your home office. You're like, I need new drapes. The wall has a crack in it. Right. I mean, we are just, you know, yes. Okay. Separating personal from work time, right? The line between work uh, and, and personal life, Justin has totally evaporated. Justiana says, stop working all day long. Uh, Chris, just same thing. Change of environment, right? Variety. That's a big one. Um, <laughs> Jasmine ordered buffalo wings in your last meeting. If you want to order some to show up at the end of my keynote at my house, I'll put my address in the chat. I'm, I'm not opposed to that. Yeah, so, so this whole concept. Oh yeah, being able to tell what day of the week it is. I learned a new word the other day. Have you heard this word yet? It is blurs day. It's like, you don't know what day it is. So it's just, it's blurs day. Uh, and in fact, I believe it was declared one of the 2020 words of the year. You miss your commute. Yes. Something that's trending right now on social media. If you check it out, it's hashtag fake commute because people are, are reviving their commutes. And we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Oh, slow internet, right? The battle for bandwidth is real. Well, you know, as I think about the challenges that we're talking about, I was thinking back and somebody mentioned this, um, uh, Ohad, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. And I apologize if I'm not, you were a remote worker before this whole thing. It's mostly the, the never leave home. And I, I can relate to your story. You know, as I think back, the first time I ever did an interview about working from home, and this is going to show my age was 2002. So I like to say I was working from home before it was coerced or cool. And I never really thought about the fact that over the course of those years between 2002 and 2020, when I would start writing a book about that topic, how many lessons I learned the difficult way by working from 
my bed, you know, the all hours of the day and night and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, as we've come forward into this time and we're looking at these evaporating lines between, between work and life, and also this temptation to work all the time, it strikes me that your laptop has become your pantry. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but now that you're at home and we've got fewer choices of, of where to go or how often we can be gone, you start with this wonderful intention, right? Like I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to fill this water bottle. It's very healthy, right? I'll get some steps. I'm going to drink some water. And then what happens when you get to your kitchen, right? The crisps are kind of like calling to you. Maybe someone in your home baked cookies. They're still out. You just have a nibble. Before you know it, last night's leftovers are calling to you from the refrigerator and you answer the call. You start grazing all day long, right? And, and I don't think there are very many physicians that would tell you that grazing, especially if you're not hungry all day long, is a very healthy habit. And I found that the same thing is happening with work. You know, we, we start grazing on work all day long, right? We're snacking on work, whether we're hungry or not. We're mindlessly checking in with our laptops and our devices. And just like what we have to do uh, to close that pantry door, I feel like we have to develop some healthy habits with work. And, you know, within that, here's what strikes me about those healthy habits is it's so easy to give into what I call just one more syndrome. Maybe you are trying to recover from this also. Just one more email, just one more tweet, just one more line of code or PowerPoint slide, just one more show on Netflix, just one more glass of wine. And suddenly we start wondering, right? Where have our nights and weekends gone? Why does it feel like I'm always working? And what I found is the, the solution, the cure, the strategy to overcome this feeling of always working and that just one more syndrome, what helps us to kind of shut that pantry door of work are routines, rituals, and boundaries. And somebody had mentioned in there, you strangely miss your commute. Uh, and, and this is the genesis of something that I've taken away that really helps. And I'll share some examples uh, from having this conversation with folks all over the world. But routines, rituals, and boundaries, the idea for that is what can you put in place and do consistently that is your go-to-work ritual? And at the end of the day, what is your leave work ritual? And there are a couple of things that I found are really critical to these go-to-work and leave work routines. First of all, they don't need to take very much time. Right, it's, you know, if you used to have a one hour commute, you don't need to replace it with a one hour go to work and leave work, work ritual, right? Um, these can be very quick, very easy. The other aspect of routines, rituals, and boundaries that really works well is when you put something in place that creates upside for you, something that is fun. So I like to think of this as making your best choice your easiest choice. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, what happens to work for me to replicate my go to work, leave work ritual is music, mindfulness, and movement. So in the morning, I start my day before I come to work with a little bit of meditation. I do a couple of yoga poses. So I kind of move. And then I write in my journal, including a few things I'm grateful for that day. And then after that, I walk upstairs just as if I were coming into the office. I power on my laptop and I go to work. At the end of the day, I listen to one of my favorite songs for about five minutes. And after I listen to it in my office, I power off my laptop. I go to another part of my house and I, I start my transition ritual. Now those happen to work for me. They don't have to be yours, but here's some of my other favorites uh, that I've heard from other people over time. Uh, one woman shared with me that to replicate her commute, she takes her bag, uh, in her case, a backpack that she used to use for her commute, and she packs up everything in it she would have taken to her office. Some snacks, a water bottle, a charger, her laptop. She literally puts it on, she goes outside, she walks around the block, comes inside, goes to where she works, and she puts her bag down, unpacks it, and starts her day. 
And at the end of the day, she does the exact same thing, powers it all off, shuts it down, puts it in her bag and leaves. So she replicated her commute. Another person I visited with was big into fitness and really struggling to find time for that. And also feeling, do you feel like these days are endless sometimes? And so what he decided to do was to break his day in half. So he would get up in the morning and do a half a day of work, pause in the middle of the day, do some exercise, take a shower, change clothes, and then have the second part of the day. And what he discovered was, first of all, he got in the exercise more consistently. Secondly, he had sort of two bursts of really good energy where he could do his best work. It was all, like almost like he had two starts to the day. Now I had another one. I have to tell you, this is one of my favorites. Uh, he's an executive at Discover, so the financial services group. And it surprised me what he said. He said, um, you know, my seven-year-old son is home and he's really confused about when my wife and I are, are working versus when we're ready to, to play with them. And it gets even more challenging when we do this scope creep thing, you know, how much everybody hates scope creep, where it kind of seems like we're not working, but we're still checking in on our devices and getting frustrated when he interrupts us. And so he said, I realized I needed something to end the work day. And I wanted it to be fun. I wanted it to be something my seven-year-old son could participate in and, and that it would also send a signal to him that I was done working for the day. And he said, I remembered a cartoon from my childhood. And in the cartoon, at the end of the day, the cartoon character would slide down the tail of a purple dinosaur and would yell out, yeah, the dabadoo. And so he started doing that. And then his son would do it with him. And he said it made them both laugh. But more importantly, it was a signal to himself. He was done with work and to his son that he was home now and it was time to play. They could transition together. So I know a lot of you have been working from home this whole time, and some of you may have done some routines, rituals, and boundaries of your own. Put them in the chat, because what I find is we all learn from each other. A few of my other favorites, the powering off all of your devices at the end of the day related to work and putting them in a spot and then turning off the light wherever you're working and walking away. And, and here's why some of you might do this now, but the powering off piece and putting those devices somewhere else like your laptop helps because you are, you know, you're making, you're putting a barrier in place so that when you get tempted to just one more or mindlessly re-engage with work, there, there's some obstacles in your way, right? If you have this powered on and it's always with you everywhere, it's really easy to get engaged, isn't it? Oh, Jasmine cooks a full lunch to take my mind off work for a break. That's great. Completely changed the channel. Uh, yoga mornings. Yes. Compulsively listen to an album after work. That's great. I, yeah, I love the, it gives you that downtime, right? Because, and I'll hear people say this, you know, what I used to do during my commute is I would listen to an audiobook or a podcast, or maybe that was the time I would call and check in with my mother or, or a family member or friend. How can I do that now? Uh, created a desk in the spare room. Yeah, I used to work at Wednesday workouts. I like the workout dance Wednesday, workout Wednesday. Evenings have a hard stop. Yes, and and something something else that really, oh, you changed the furniture around for the weekend feel. I like that one. Uh, I find so often we put movement to what we do, it really helps. Uh, that's great, your weekend, the weekend furniture setup. And then you feel like you've instituted some variety in your same surroundings, right? Well, you know, as I think about, you know, these, these routines, rituals, and boundaries, I, I know that we all are aspirational. And I'm curious how many of you, you can do show of hands or, you know, if you're willing to show them, how many people made a New Year's resolution at, at some point along the way, or even, I, I call it also the pandemic promise. Did you have, did you have a pandemic promise, right? It's something like, um, you know, you're going to learn a new language, maybe you're going to pick up a new hobby or skill. Uh, in my particular case, the pandemic promise that I made was that I was going to ride my bike more consistently. I thought, this is great. I won't be on an airplane like I normally am. No problem. So I started, you know, I started riding my bike and I was out one morning on my bike and I was kind of in this idyllic scene, you know, where I'm starting to watch the sun come up and I'm thinking to myself, isn't isn't this fantastic? It's so peaceful. You know, I could, I could smell like some coffee kind of brewing somewhere. I wanted to go to that person's house and be like, hi, can I have some coffee? 
And right as I'm getting soaked into this scene, I literally find myself flying over the handlebars of my bike. <laughs> and as I started getting up and brushing myself off, fortunately unhurt, I was, I was realizing how did I miss, you know, this, this kind of pothole in the road, right? This, this hole that was right in front of me. And the challenge was, I was still pretty far from home when that happened. And because of that, I had two choices. Either, have you ever done this where you push your bicycle, right? You know, back to your house and you're like walking beside it. It's not very fun. And it makes the journey seem very long Or I was going to have to get back on that same bike and ride. And what was so funny was when I, when I did that, that was the choice I selected. I was a little bit wobbly. You know how you pedal a bike and you're going really slowly. You're like, Whoa, what do I do? And and what I realized was, you know, it was such a great example of what we are kind of living through, right? I mean, the only way forward is through. We all have to keep pedaling. But the, I think the challenge of the time that we're in right now is even things that we knew how to do before in our jobs, right? Like manage people or work with stakeholders or, you know, build a network of people or, you know, have your boss have a certain impression of you are things we're having to learn again because the context has shifted substantially, right? And that, that kind of feeling of learning how to ride the bike again, it's a, it's a little bit wobbly. And when I start to think about you know, the temptation, it's we want to take on everything and do everything and try everything. Can any of you relate to that? Like you just, you say, yes, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna keep going. And so you know, I, I wanna offer a, a couple of thoughts, a couple of strategies that I'm finding are really helpful to kind of quiet the noise and, and figure out what matters. And the first one I really want to talk about, because I, I was sharing with you that, you know, and, and in the description, we were talking about, you know, what it takes to really move forward. And, and I found it's accept, adapt, accelerate. And accept says, when I look at what's happening around me, if my circumstances aren't going to change, how can I change my relationship with my circumstances? Right? You know, as we look around at what's happening, you know, there's this greater context, and we ask ourselves, how long is this going to last? I don't know the answer to that question. No one does. But what I think about is, if shelter in place is going to stay longer or we can't have these in-person gatherings, it's okay to be disappointed about that, but how can we change our relationship with that circumstance and how can we see what's possible? And, and in thinking about how to change our relationship with our circumstances, I would offer just a two word question that I have found has really helped open my eyes to see what's possible as opposed to what's impossible or feels impossible. And also to accept that we're just in a different chapter. And, and I would offer these two words to you and they are, why not? You might have a fantastic idea that you proposed before and it fell flat, but the context has shifted, so why not? You know, you might have tried a hobby before or, you know, tried to transform your well-being, whatever that looks like for you, or put boundaries in place to not work all the time and it hasn't gone well. You can always try again. Why not? And something along the way of my journey where that really showed up for me, we were talking about the two books. And, and the funny thing that happened was, you know, I was, I was set to write this book, this Listen Up book, and this, the manuscript was due May 1st. And it was going to come out the end of October. And when the shelter in place happened, I thought, this is great. I won't be flying. I can probably write a better book. I can be healthier doing it. And along the way, um, I submitted that manuscript. I felt great. Yes, you know, you're picturing how success will feel. We all have those moments, right? And about a week and a half after that, I was talking with my publisher. And we started talking about working from home because I don't know about some of you. I, I feel like living and being in the technology world, we're in a little bit of a better spot to adapt than some other people around us because you know we know how to use technology. We're comfortable inherently with it or can learn really quickly. And so I was chatting with her and I was saying, oh, I started this working from home blog and I'm on the Salesforce work from home task force. 
it's amazing how much people are consuming this content. Like people, I think need help. What's it like in the publishing industry? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, working from home, do you think you could write a book about that? And I laughed. I literally was like, <laughs> I could do that in my sleep. And she said, do you think you could do it in two weeks? I said, no. I kind of wondered if she had been drinking actually. And she said, how about 30 days? And I said, why not? So this book, I wrote this book in 30 days and it came out in less than 90 days. So, so I submitted this one first, this one actually launched first. Interesting. And I offered that to say, responding why not opened me up to this concept of what's possible. Right? What's possible if the circumstances around me aren't going to change? And I wonder what would happen if you posed that question to something that you want to try or something that feels impossible. The other piece that came along with that, and for some of you who I've had the opportunity to meet and spend some time with before, I often like to say I'm a student of success. I love to study successful people, you know, what they do, their habits figure out how to make these adjustments. And for me, one of the things that was so fascinating about, you know, kind of inserting this big new project in that wasn't there before is it, it brought me to this thought of there's so many things that we have wrong about our relationship with success. And, and I'll give you a couple of examples and see if maybe these resonate with you. So one is we think that success will show up, you know, in a linear fashion, right? I will have a good idea. I will do hard work. I will get the right people on board. I will execute and then success will happen, right? It's going to happen sequentially. It's going to be a sum of its parts. And, you know, if I had stuck with that, I never would have done the working from home book. I might not be here. Who knows? But I was thinking, isn't that interesting? You know, we put these parameters on what success and what progress look like when really what would happen if we made it possible for success to show up minute by minute. And, and I'll give you another example of, of how I think we put a constraint around success. What do you think are two of the most limiting words around success that people use? Put them in the chat. What are some guesses? Two words that limit our success. Sometimes no limits our success but should, oh, that's a big one. Should and can't, those are definitely mindset shifts for sure. Not now, you're really close. You are very close. So this is what I've noticed. Have you ever been this person, you know, uh, you know, along the way in this journey or in life? We should be back to the office by now. We should be able to have events by now. I should be promoted by now or married by now or have a child by now. I found those two words by now put us in the mindset of a constraint. They keep us from being agile and adaptive because what happens is we expect that something should have already happened. And what I discovered is those two words by now very quickly become a tagline for suffering and not for success. And what I found was when you take away those two words by now, you free success to show up moment by moment. Well, one other thought that I will offer to you before we take a few questions is in thinking about this accept, adapt, accelerate, and thinking about, you know, these circumstances around us that, you know, look uncertain. And I think the beginning of a new year is always the time, you know, where we think about this question. You know, we think we we maybe think and maybe you chatted about this or did a Twitter poll about it for all I know. You know, we stop and ask ourselves, like, what will this new year bring? And when I started thinking about just the simple mindset shift of what will this new year bring, what I realized is when I ask myself that question, I'm setting myself up to live in this reactive mode. Like all these things are going to happen to me and to us. And our job is just to try to respond to those as best we can. And I thought, what would happen if we started asking ourselves instead of what will this new year bring? What will I bring to this new year? How could you put yourself in the driver's seat? 
how could you put yourself in a position to accelerate and to see what's possible? So what I found is, you know, asking that, what will I bring to this year? And pairing that up with the why not and subtracting a little by now is a great formula to open yourself up to adapt to what's happening and to really accelerate into using this as a time of opportunity and connection. With that, I will take some questions from you. And yes, Helen G, imposter syndrome is real. And I have to tell you, something I am really loving about this period of time that we're in, as strange as it would say, and I, I wouldn't wish the circumstance of how we got here, certainly, is I'm finding that everyone is in a position to contribute. I mean, I love it. I don't know if this is showing up around you. It's like you start to discover someone has a hidden skill that's suddenly relevant, right? It's like, oh, you're a painter and then we can all get some paint supplies. You can teach us how to paint. This will be amazing, right? Um, you know, I love the, you know, someone that says, hey, we're all feeling isolated and disconnected in our jobs. I have an idea about how we can connect and have some fun. It's like everybody can contribute something because we all ended up in the exact same circumstance at essentially the exact same time. And out of that can come, you know, opportunities for everyone to contribute. And, and I love it. I think it's adding to a richness of new ideas, new people, you know, raising up as, as leaders and, and also what I call kind of fun captains. I think it's, you know, everybody needs a Helen is what I would say. Well, Questions, <laughs> feedback, yes. Okay, I really Karen, love this. Sorry, go on, go on. I was gonna, I was going to ask because you talked about the book and the fact that you wrote the book in thirty days, which is stunning, by the way. <laughs> I mean, wow. But I'd like to, I'd like to explore that actually because you have a very full time job with Salesforce. How did you manage to then meet that deadline, and how did you get into that rhythm of just going today? I write, and I and I can have this time to do it. Well, I took a page from this group and I thought about this a little bit in terms of agile sprints, I will tell you. So here was my thought process. So I have found, and I don't know if you found this too, when I am clear about what success means to me or you know, the one goal that's most important to me, it becomes a wonderful filter to quiet lots of other noise and to decide what I'm going to say yes to and what I'm going to say no to and where I'm going to spend my time. I've often found, yes, start with purpose. When I'm not clear about what success looks like or what my goal is or what I'm kind of driving toward, that's when I say yes to everything because I feel like it's like I'm either trying to find it or I just have no filter to say, uh, does this move me closer to or further from my goal? So, so I'll just start there because, because I find then it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, I should say yes to this. What, <laughs> what else would I be doing? Um, and then I start to feel very scattered. I don't know if you've been there. And then you're like, you're spending a lot of energy and time, but you're not really sure where it's taking you. It's exhausting. And so first was get clear on my definition of success or a goal. And so I thought to myself, okay, let's just say I say yes to this. and. I, I'm going to do, write this in 30 days. Okay, that's a crystal clear goal. Um, what would I need to say yes to or what would I need to say no to? And, and I'll share with you a life philosophy that I observed my grandmother live throughout the course of her life. Uh, and when she passed away, I inherited many of her unfinished projects uh, because the entire lens by which she essentially lived her life was what matters. So the reason there was still like unironed shirts hanging on the ironing board was because that didn't matter. But she always had time, right? To like tell you a joke or, you know, hug out a heartbreak with you or play a game, right? So it was what matters. So I thought, okay, if I took that strategy and looked at what matters, what matters is some clear box of writing time. What matters is taking care of my health and well being so that I'm in a space where I can create and sustain myself and not at the end of the, you know, 30 day writing sprint, just fall completely apart, you know, become ill and need to spend the next two weeks in bed recovering from how I didn't take care of myself in order to, to get to this goal. So that was the next thing, kind of what matters. Within that, I literally looked at my calendar for that entire 30 day period of time. And I asked three questions, maybe a fourth. One, does it have to be, same with my task list, does it have to be me? Does it have to be me right now? 
and does it have to be a meeting? And so I was like, all right, some set of things can just go because it doesn't have to be, or it doesn't have to be me or me right now or a meeting, whatever. Focusing in on what matters. The next piece, and this is, this is where I would say the, the kind of agile sprint methodology came into play for me, is I blocked out 90 minute writing sprints. And at the end of every 90 minute writing sprint, I would give myself a reward. Now, later I kind of brought that technique back as a 90 minute editing sprint because if, if you submit a book like manuscript in 30 days, and then it's coming out in less than 90 days, you literally send the manuscript in and 48 hours, they send it back to you to edit. It's like, I haven't even forgotten that I wrote this yet. I can't see this with fresh eyes. It's been 48 hours. Like I've had two cups of coffee since last I saw this, right? So um, these 90 minute sprints. So here's what worked really well. And I do this now anytime I need to create. And this could be create a presentation, write a blog, create whatever create looks like in your world. So I make sure that, you know, I have my, my water, uh, uh, tea, what, you know, whatever. Uh, and that I, you know, if you need a snack, whatever that looks like, but I'm fully prepared in that sense. Then I put my phone on airplane mode. I close all of the tabs, you know, on my laptop that I'm not using, right? Cause you know, you get this thing where you've got all these tabs going and then literally I set a timer on my, uh, on my mobile device for 90 minutes. And all I do for 90 minutes is like write or, you know, create whatever that looks like. And then at the end of the 90 minutes and the time goes off and yes, it's true. It's not just for tech projects at the end, when the nine, when the timer goes off, I give myself a little reward that might be walking outside. I might do some stretching. I might listen to Don't Stop Me Now by Queen for a couple of times. I don't know why, maybe, yes, because I would get fired up. And then I would do a check-in with myself at that point of, am I, am I making enough progress? Like, am I kind of in some momentum that I will do a second 90 minute block? Or do I feel like that is all I've got for right now and I need to go do something else and come back? So I literally got through it in this 90 minute sprint and that's how I would block it on my, on my calendar as well. And it made a big difference. And then something else that, that I did is I increased the reward for myself the longer the duration of time was going to go on. So when I knew I had, I think I had 72 hours to do those edits. So now I need to read my own book like three times, sort of. So I would be like, chap, you know, forward if working from home is written by a professional race car driver. That's very fun to read. Okay, so tiny reward after that, right? It's like step off my treadmill desk stretch, walk outside, have a breath of fresh air, five minutes, come back. Okay. Chapter one, right? At the end of chapter one, now it's like, now I will have sparkling water. What a treat. Okay. By like chapter 10, it's like, I will eat a bag of sour batch kids. I'm not advocating this is the best thing, but I was like, like the reward had to get bigger. And then the other thing I did, and this is a little bit taken, you know, a page from kind of the agile book is after going through it sequentially that direction, the next time I, I read it or worked on the task, I went backwards because I was nervous. You know how this goes. You get to the end of a project, you're getting tired, right? I mean, you're just like so fatigued. You want it to be done. So I would literally start with the last chapter or the acknowledgements and then edit backwards so that my brain would be forced to not see things in a sequential order. Uh, so that made a big difference as well. But yeah, I applied some of these mindsets of this, this kind of sprint methodology, this, you know, kind of the agile methodology to the concept of creation. Um, and then the other thing is at the end of that 30 days, like, I mean, I took a full 24 hours where I was completely device free. I, I mean, I did not try to create anything. I barely counted on myself to remember my own name because I was like, your brain is very tired now. Good job. Take a break. That helped. Uh, what was the retro like at the end of the book writing sprint? Uh, so how did I, how did I kind of bounce back from that? How did I move forward? Is that the question? Smart suites. Yes. Yes. I did do the smart suites. I like those. And I also like the, um, I think it's called surf suites. They do some great sour gummy worms, but yes. Um, and somebody asked me, what is the idea for the next book? Uh, so a couple things. One is right now I've taken kind of the concepts from the three books and I'm turning them into classes because people want to go deeper on some of these concepts. 
So there's a 21 day version where you get like a five minute video each day and a little assignment, one group coaching call. There's a six week version and a six month version. Um, and so I've got a number of companies that are doing this with teams and batches. So I'm kind of doing this teaching and then I created a two part masterclass that's going to be translated into 12 languages. So stay tuned, very exciting. All about success, explore success and experience success. And uh, two ideas for the next book. Maybe you can vote on it and tell me what you think is great. Uh, one is, so I wrote working from home and now I think we need a returning to work book. Like one year later, like his, here's what's happening, right? We're coming up on this. Well, we're going to get to this vaccines or herd immunity or whatever. And in our heads, we're all just going to go back to the way things were right. Except that we're not. So how can organizations and individuals plan for that next wave of, oh my gosh, we aren't all going back to exactly how everything was. There's some set of things that have shifted in the world of work now, either for good or for a while longer. So how do you plan ahead for that? So it'd sort of be like one year later. Okay, so now we all work from home. Now we're at the midpoint where we're trying to return to work. What's shifted, what's changed? How do you plan? How do you succeed? How do you be well? Uh, the other one is around leadership. So committed leadership. So kind of based on some of these courses. You tell me, what were my takeaways? Wow, uh, a couple of things. First of all, uh, saying yes to the working from home book is one of the best yes career decisions I've ever made because people need help and hope. And so people gravitate toward wanting to talk about this topic because it's a, it's a pain, it's a challenge that we've all shared. Uh, so I'm glad I said yes. And within that, my lesson to myself is, you know, that wasn't in my plan at the beginning of the year. I mean, I love a well thought out plan. I love a list where you check things off. I love it. It somehow like feeds my soul. This wasn't on the list and it wasn't in the plan. And I just felt compelled to say yes and go with it. I literally said, why not? And did it. And it has taken me on this really remarkable path. So it has been a, a just absolutely crystal clear reminder um, that things don't always go according to plan. And sometimes that's fantastic. And, and going with opportunity and momentum when you see it is still work, but there's a flow to it. I guess we'll do flow here since we're going to do it, throw out all, you know, all technical terms, but you get into a flow of there's a rhythm to that. So um, it was a great reminder to myself that you can't plan out everything perfectly and just keep doing the plan that, that you can adapt and that can put you on a better path. Um, the next thing that I really took away is how awesome it is to be able to feature lots of really smart people. I mean, this is the beautiful thing about writing a book is there are all kinds of different people uh, from all walks of life and companies that all contributed something cool, you know, from a, an award-winning race car driver to a partner at Accenture to, you know, a customer experience executive at a tech company. I mean, there's this huge, and, and a teacher at a school uh, who's a single parent, right? I mean, just everybody can contribute to that topic. And it's really fun to benefit from other people's thought leadership. And it gave more of a feeling of this is the group journey, right? Because for an extrovert to go sit in the corner working from home and writing a manuscript sometimes can feel like being punished. <laughs> like it doesn't feel the extrovert part of myself. I was like, no, this is still a fun tool for engagement. Um, and then I would say the other thing kind of in retrospect is we can really do things that we think or believe or feel or somehow have had reinforced are impossible if we will shift our mindset. And I think the biggest work of this time that we're living in, not just if you say yes to a book or a big project, is the mindset shift and continuing to come back to, you know, creativity is not quarantined. A uh, human, you know, being able to create, right, is, is not quarantined. There's lots of things that we can shift our mindset about to focus on what's possible. And I, I think it really, that came to life for me in a really, in a very real way by doing this because I didn't have time to consume the news and, you know, the daily statistics of what was happening. You know, I, ha I felt this sense of purpose and how compelling that can be. Um, to keep you grounded during really uncertain times. So you might've gotten more than you asked for there, but those are some things I took away. <laughs> that's, 
great, Karen. Thank you so much for sharing those sort of uh, reflections on your book writing as well and um, everything. It kind of encompasses uh, every walk of life, really, doesn't it? In everything that you do, it's so important to have that, that time to be able to do that. Do we have any other burning questions you've been a bit nervous to ask, maybe? Just go ahead, pop it in the chat, or if, if maybe just one, one more before we, we let everyone sort of wrap up. Question. Okay. Well, that's fun. How do you help your team? How do you help your team through it? Uh, you have a very clear set, even you know that filtering criteria to, mm -hmm. to be able to choose what's important and what matters. But how do you help others? Yes. Something that I have found is very helpful during this period of time is co-creation. Here's another great you know, skill, I think, from, from the agile and tech world. The beauty of co-creation is two things. One is it's a tool to get to some new ideas. It's also a tool to help combat this isolation. You know, When you co-create, by definition, you're connected with someone else. And so because of wanting to, to help contribute to solving for some of the isolation, that we're all feeling and to see what's possible, right? What can we contribute? What can we create? I've done a number of projects with colleagues, you know, and people on the team, uh, whether that's research about the future of customer experience or, you know, any other, um, some things around the United Nations, uh, the sustainability goals and that sort of thing. And within that, what I found is oh, it's giving us something that we're producing together. So we're creating a shared win, which is wonderful teamwork. But it also gives you that very strong feeling like I'm not going it alone. And that person isn't either. So, so that co-creation and what you're delivering and creating becomes a really powerful tool to feel that human connection and to feel like you're not alone. And I found that's one of the most powerful things. And then also uh, we do have a, a weekly just social coffee hour you know, a few, th few work things might come up, but we, we chat about what's happening in the news. You know, I've, I've discovered coworkers have and team members have amazing skills I never knew. So making time to just be human, you know, and just connect is important. But I found that co-creation tool is really powerful for kind of over overcoming that isolation and really helping people innovate and go in a new direction and have, you know, have a new project to dive into, get excited about, you know, another professional credential, whatever that looks like. Yeah, great. So thank you so much. I mean, I've certainly got a number of key takeaways. Like I really loved this, uh, that your grandma's concept of like what matters. I think it's a great strategy that I'll certainly like call home um, to me. And I definitely need to ask myself that more every day um, when trying to prioritize all my, you know, clients and different work that I'm doing and stuff. Um, you know, this bit also when you were talking about grazing on work, that kind of hit home to me because I, you know, I do exactly those sorts of things like check my phone and do all this and that and the other and never really think of it as an unhealthy habit. But actually, like, you know, if I was doing that with crisps every day, um, <laughs> my, my gut would probably argue a little bit with that. So, yeah, thank you so much. It's been, you know, so fantastic to have you here. Um, today and for you to share those insights with us it's, it's been really great and thank you to everybody else who has who has joined as well um, yeah. and you know that key value like responding to change over following a plan um, and that's kind of what's you know like you say sort of brought you um, some of the excess, successes that you've had this year and last year and stuff so fantastic thank you very much thank you. great to be with all of you have a great day and evening or you know wherever you are <laughs> Have a great next hour. Yes. <laughs> well said. All right, folks, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.